The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, a senior China Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, way back in 2015, you and I were getting ready for the Forum on China Africa Cooperation Summit that was being held then in Johannesburg, and we created a website called reporting focacom It's still up, so I highly recommend everybody go check it out. And on that website, we had a section of the five must-read books on China-Africa relations. Now, at the time, I was like, well, this is 2015. China-Africa relations is becoming far more interesting, far more popular. Lots of people are starting to follow it. And I would have imagined that from 2015 all the way to 2019, we would have seen a lot more literature on the subject. Uh, but very quickly, Kobus, let me refresh your memory back to 2015 as to what we then decided were the five must-read books. And I want to hear from you if you think these are still the five must-read books or if there are new ones. Number one that we said, uh, China's Second Continent, really an excellent book by Howard French, uh, How a Million Migrants Are Building a New Empire in Africa. That really is a must-read on any kind of list, and that will still stay that way, even though it's uh, a few years old. The Looting Machine by Tom Burgess. He's a investigative correspondent at the Financial Times. Uh, that had a strong China theme in it. Of course, The Dragon's Gift, which is by Deborah Braudigam, who is a professor at Johns Hopkins University and head of the China Africa Research Initiative. China and Africa, A Century of Engagement by David Shin and Joshua Eisenman, two old friends of the show, two scholars. And finally, another scholar from Denmark, uh, uh, Luke Patey, who st studies in Denmark, The New Kings of Crude, China, India, and the Global Struggle for Oil in Sudan and the South Sudan. Okay, Kobus, those were the five that we picked back in 2015. What would you update the list today with, or do you feel that there's been enough literature that's been added that we can't even update the list? You know, I would not throw any of those under the bus. I, you know, kind of they're, they're all fantastic. Um, and you know, there's this, there's a lot of other authors to read on on China Africa issues. Um, since then, I think the the, the field has, has uh, really uh, gotten a lot more fine grained. You know, kind of so so there's 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 a, a host of amazing people working on 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 in detail on a lot of different sub sub fields within the China Africa um, field. Um, but I think you know. It's, it's sometimes the, the field itself or the relationship itself has changed so much since that time that it one needs to kind of get um, one needs a, a book that gives you a kind of a finger on the pulse, you know, kind of where you where you can get a, an overview of the of, of what's of what's going on across the entire landscape of the China Africa relationship. Because as more people work in more and more niches within that relationship, it becomes harder and harder to see uh, this kind of bird's eye view of what's actually going on you know, on, on, you know, where, where you can see the entire thing as a map. Yeah. And one of the openings that I think that was in the marketplace for a long time, which has now been filled, is really creating a book that is accessible to a much wider audience. A lot of the China Africa research and books that are out there are, are quite thick, to be honest with you. And they're written by academics. And I'll bring your attention to one, of course, uh, Chris Alden and Dan Large, um, two professors and, you know, smartest guys in the room when it comes to, to China, Africa. They wrote a book and you contributed to it, New Directions in Africa, China Studies. That came out in 2018. Uh, it's got a lot of different contributors to it. I'm halfway through it. And I have to be honest with you, it ain't easy. <laughs> you guys write. <laughs> Is your spirit being oh, broken it, it, by the academics? Just, <laughs> it just doesn't read well. I mean, I mean, for I mean, it reads great, <laughs> but it's just thick with academic prose, and it's, it's just hard to get through. And it yeah. feels like you guys are writing for each <laughs> other. And uh, and that to me is the hard part as a layman who's trying to kind of figure these things out. So so a new book kind of came out a couple weeks ago, and it is really a stunning accomplishment. And it's one of those books where you thought to yourself, 
damn, I wish I did this because I could have done this. <laughs> but it was just so well done. And I probably couldn't have done anywhere near as well as it is. It's The Complete Beginner's Guide to China-Africa Relations by Lina Geracho Ayeno, who is in Beijing. And Lina, I'm sorry, Lina, welcome to the program. Thank you so much and congratulations for your book. It's really amazing. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an amazing opportunity to be here with you, Kobus and Eric. I listen to you guys all the time. So being on the show is a dream. Oh, well, we are honored to have you on the program in part to talk to you about your show, about your book. I'm so nervous already. I'm making all these mistakes. Uh, let me first kind of tell everybody a little bit about you. Um, you, in addition to writing this book on China-Africa relations, you also are the author of another book. And it, it's kind of like a Guinness Book of World Records kind of thing here, where they're the only book in the world that uh, has taught Mandarin Chinese to Ethiopia, in Ethiopia, to Americ speakers, right? Yes, that's right. Um, that's amazing. And then oh, you've also you. set up an education, set up uh, education for Ethiopia, which is a special enterprise that creates educational content in local languages. And and Kobus, I'm going to make you feel a little bit inadequate here, okay? Uh, Lena speaks one, two, three, four, five different languages, Americ, English, French, Spanish, and Chinese. She's a graduate of Yale University, where she completed both undergraduate and graduate programs and now lives in Beijing. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'm just hiding under there the desk right now. <laughs> OK, uh, let's get back. Uh, let's get to your book. This is, um, again, as I said, it is a book that is very, very special because it is meant for the non-expert. And when you and I were talking offline, you said that this is not a book you said would be for us. And I completely disagree because I love how you've organized information by, you know, five different years. You take all the key themes. Why don't you tell us a little bit about kind of how your background and your story led you up to this to this book? And uh, so before we get into the book too deeply, Love to hear a little bit more about your, your personal journey from Ethiopia to China via New Haven, Connecticut. Oh, thank you so much. Um, you reading um, my my resume makes makes it sound like you know better than I am. So th thank you. Um, the, the my journey um, towards this book is actually anything but direct. Um, so I grew up in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, the capital of Ethiopia, and um, I lived there. Uh, all my life until I was 18, until the end of high school. And I got this amazing opportunity to study at Yale University. So I moved to New Haven, Connecticut. And while I was there, I had envisioned a completely different, you know, outcome to my life, if you will. Um, I wanted to study medicine and, you know, all that jazz, you know, the typical African hardworking student who wants to be an, you know, an engineer or a lawyer or, or a doctor. But once I got there, you know, um, the, the debates that were going on on campus and I kind of also, you know, I felt like I, I could excel in the social sciences so much better than in the, in the, in the natural sciences. So I slowly started gravitating towards them until I completely changed my major and started studying political science. So, but mind you, the entire time while I was at Yale University, China was not on my radar. You know, I was like you mentioned, I was I was studying um, European languages because I wanted to be a little bit more apt at com communicating with um, people from Francophone African nations. So, you know, I studied a lot of French and then, you know, Spanish later on to kind of continue on the theme of communicating with other parts of the world that could have similar challenges that um, my own country faces. So. But China was not on my radar because for some reason I didn't think that it was like I didn't it wasn't even something to consider until um, I was about to um, graduate from my um, um, from my master's program. And, you know, at that time, the job market in the U.S. was really terrible. And a lot of my friends who were who had all the right paperwork to work in the U.S. were not finding jobs that really 
um, that they deserve. And they were massively underemployed. And so I was like, you know, I need to go somewhere where there's much more happening. And at the time, someone I knew what had who graduated from uh, Yale had already moved to Beijing and he had a lot more experience in 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 China even before attending the graduate school program. So I kind of asked him for, for, for advice. I was like, you know, I'm thinking about moving there. And he was like, you should do it. You like no hesitation whatsoever. And he really, you know, encouraged me. And so once China was on my radar, I started looking for programs, um, you know, not like actively, but, you know, my mind was open to them. And the Yale China Association was recruiting at the time. And I attended you know, I saw a poster, I attended an information session and I said, you know, I would love to apply for your program, um, but I have no background in Chinese. I do not speak speak like a lick of Mandarin and, you know, will you have me? And they were like, you know, you can still apply and you can still go through the interview process. So I was, I was encouraged by that. And, you know, I went through the process and um, basically I got in. And it's a really, um, it's, it's, a, it's a program that has been going on since 1901. So one of the oldest programs that connect um, the U.S. And, uh, and China, and which is an interesting twist because I'm an Ethiopian and they don't have a lot of... Um, you know, African um, applicants um, usually, but since since my time, so many more have come. Uh, but at the time, it wasn't that common, and so yeah, so I, I came to China and I started teaching here in a city called Changsha in Hunan Province at the Xiangya Medical School, and then um, moved to Beijing, and I was completely enamored by China and uh, started learning the language. And there was a time when I had to go back because the person who encouraged me to come to China in the first place ended up being my fiance. So we had to get married. We wanted to get married and was complicated to get married um, in, in China as an Ethiopian citizen to an American passport holder. So I went back to Ethiopia. And that was like where all the shift happened, where I was, you know, I went back to my parents' house started, you know, living there as a regular citizen and the entire neighborhood has, was completely transformed. There were so many Chinese businesses and that's when I started saying, oh my gosh, something amazing is happening and I wanted to be a part of it. And so when I used to, you know, walk into Chinese supermarkets and say hello to, to, to the Laoban, the, the, the owner of the store, you know, I'll just say ni hao and, and they would be so amazed. They were like, oh wow, you, your Chinese is so good. Are you looking for a job? And I would, I'd be shocked because this consistently happened to me. And I realized there's a huge demand for people who can speak Am- Amharic and um, Chinese. But, you know, I was like, oh, you know, is there something that helps Ethiopians learn Chinese? And so I went to bookstores to do a little bit of market research and I couldn't find any materials. So I started, you know, just working on teaching, like working on a way to teach uh, Mandarin Chinese, introductory level Mandarin Chinese to Amharic speakers. And um, I recruited a couple of Chinese friends to do the audio portion. And, um, you know, at the time, I actually found that um, even when I was learning Mandarin, that um, Amharic, the Amharic alphabet really captures Chinese sounds well. So I incorporated all of my learnings from that into the book. And as you know, a, a, a part of the other activities was, that I did in the China Africa space was, you know, doing some research, market research for various institutions and doing some consulting. And um, the how this book, the the begin the complete beginner's guide to China African relations, this was born because uh, a company had commissioned me to write a general overview of China Africa relations, and so that is how it started. I started writing that. My curiosity grew, and I kept doing it year after year for five years. And now the 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 combination of all of that work is what re- resulted in this book. So that that's a really long way, <laughs> but that is how I got here, essentially. The outline, the the structure of the book is, is really a, a, a very useful and interesting one for me. So where you essentially... 
you essentially give a, a survey of a whole bunch of different China Africa issues and you divide it year by year. So can you tell us how you, how you, um, decided on that structure and what, what you felt the, the kind of strengths of, of, of structuring the book on a year to year basis was? <laughs> Right. So um, the the book actually serves two functions. Obviously, um, as the title suggests, is for beginners. So I try to simplify things as much as possible. And it's intended for people who are not experts, uh, such as yourselves. Like I, I always tell people, if you wake up every morning listening to Eric and Kobe's um, uh, podcast, then you need help. Then you need help. <laughs> <laughs> this book is probably not for you. Like if you are a PhD student um, in this space, this book is probably not for you. I say it because it's for people who are interested in the subject and do not know where to start. So um, the structure of the book, um, not only is it for beginners, but it also serves as a time capsule because each of this, those sections were written at, the, at, at that time. So the 2014 section was written in 2014. The 2015 section was written in 2015, et cetera. And I had, let me tell you, I had this amazing urge to make sure to update everything and make one big chunk of a book. But I realized that there's a lot of value in capturing the thoughts and the data of that time, as opposed to making the 21st, the 2015 version of events in 2018 you know, which 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 will not serve that big of a purpose in you know far out in the future. So so if I said that the struct you know I had strategized in advance about the structure, I'd be lying because each year you know I didn't think this was going to become a book. I, it was a report that people expected me. You know I still have to I, still, I, I that I you know I became the lady who summarized events between China and Africa, and then. Um, I kept on doing it for five years, and this is basically the combination. So in hindsight, it worked out, but it wasn't a grand strategy. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa Channel Reporting Project at Wits University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at Vits China Africa or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. I can see why it's interesting that you kept the years separate from one another. And in some ways, that's very, very special because where we are today is not where we were even just a few years ago. So let me kind of bring people back to 2014. 2014, in many ways, was, at least on paper, was the peak of the China-Africa economic relationship. The trading relationship was at its height at about $220 billion in bilateral trade. Investment was rising. There was this sense still of, if you will, innocence about the relationship. Uh, the debt issue had not kind of come onto the radar at that time. Still, Africans, African leaders were excited about the FOCAC process of getting these big financial packages. And then fast forward all the way to last year's FOCAC in September here in Beijing and the debt issue and the loans issue and the the elite to elite corruption issues, all of that came to play. And there's more of a cloud as this relationship has matured in many ways. And I think what was interesting about reading the the different years that you captured you get that optimism all the way to the 2018 portion where we're starting to see this creeping skepticism come into the relationship. And that to me was very, very interesting. And I'm just wondering, as you were tracing back the years, did you see these kind of trend lines start to appear? And if so, what trends did you see when you were putting the book together? Um, that's exactly it. Um, things started getting more and more complex as we started learning uh, more and more about them. So um, the 2014 section of the book is is the most is the the simplest uh, portion of the book because um, basically the the thinking at the time was there were two camps: um, the, the China's good for Africa and China's bad for Africa, and um, Basically, the China's bad for Africa camp used a lot of words like neocolonization and things like that, and and that was you know it's such a it's 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 a scary um, you know undefined lump of a thing you know and and that was 
so much more, you know, it wasn't concrete. Whereas fast forward to 2018, even the debt issue became an actual concrete thing that you can measure with numbers. And um, as more and more research started coming out, you started seeing all the nuances. And I think in the future also that's going to continue. I always say, like, I hope that, you know, as we get into the particulars, people will shy away from making blanket statements about China-Africa relations. And that's what I learned. Even my own thinking has evolved and matured over the five years because I was definitely on the camp that's like, you know, China is amazing for Africa to now it's like a little bit more mature and saying, you know, we need to take everything on a case by case basis. We need to take you know, Africa is a huge continent with many communities, many societies, many many issues. China is the same way, and and um, the nuance is going to be what you know. The devils in the details, and uh, is basically the conclusion that I came to. So, yes, I completely follow. You know, um, it's it's very interesting that to also I think take a, an Ethiopian perspective to you know to, to to write about the whole relationship in this kind of survey year by year survey way, but for also from an Ethiopian perspective because Ethiopia has in a lot of ways been this epicenter of China Africa you know relations. Um, how how did you how do you feel your your kind of perspective from Ethiopia affected the way that you that you look at the relationship as a whole? You know, um, like you said, Ethiopia is a very interesting case because it's always brought up as the chair, as the headquarters of the African Union, and also um, one of those countries in Africa that is not particularly resource rich, and so the cooperation between China and um, Ethiopia is always cited as like a you know a prime example of the non-stereotypical interactions that China has with African countries. Um, There are a few things um, that informs my view um, because I have an Ethiopian perspective. So in Ethiopia, for example, um, I think that we generally have a positive view of um, China as an entity. Um, That could be because certain sectors, um, such as the retail sector, has long been closed to foreigners. So the general public is not exposed to competition on on a low level. If you get what I mean, like if you if you are um, uh, an owner of a very small shop that retails, let's say, dolls, um, chances are you're not going to encounter a Chinese version of your shop down the street. So that contributes to the general view that we have of China, because we hear China in terms of investments, infrastructure and, uh, you know, education, especially a lot of Ethiopian children, um, a lot of Ethiopian, uh, let's, you know, undergraduates and graduate students are being educated in China. So so the, the public perception of China in general is very positive. And um, in addition, let me tell you something really interesting. Um, I I was, um, you know, having a conversation with a couple of researchers who are studying, um, you know, China-Africa relations in uh, Addis Ababa. And they were like, you know, somebody brought somebody brought this to our attention. Um, apparently, when Europeans walk down the streets, you know, people on the street, like uh, or like children, would call them, "Oh, China, China!" Like you're Chinese, and I was like, well, "That can't be true." Ethiopia has been exposed to Europeans way longer than we've, you know, we've been exposed to um, Asians or Chinese people. And guess what? That is true. In some parts of Ethiopia, um, the only foreign person that they interact with with frequency is a Chinese person. So anyone who does not look Ethiopian could be classified um, as Chinese. So, so the relationship between China and Ethiopia, I think, is on a people to people level, as they say, is interesting. And definitely, I'm, I cannot shy away from that influence. One of the shortcomings of the book, and it's the same shortcoming that we have at the China Africa Project. So this is not meant in any way as a criticism. But one of the the difficulties, and I've only been reading the 2018 sections and I've glanced through the rest, but I I kind of feel that this is it, is it's very difficult to get the China voice 
because the Chinese are difficult to engage oftentimes. There's a lot of reluctance from scholars to talk to authors and to podcasters and to outsiders. Um, this is a, a much more tense time in China. People are worried about their safety and saying the wrong things on the record. Oftentimes, the Chinese press uh, is not very helpful either. It's heavily filled with propaganda. A lot of it is just, it's just not very interesting. So getting that authentic Chinese position and Chinese voice incorporated into any story is uh, is very difficult. And in fact, I say this again as a little bit of self-criticism on our part, that we don't have enough Chinese voices on our show. We're doing very, very well with African voices. We have a lot of international voices, um, but we don't have enough Chinese. And it's it, it's not because we're not trying. We go out and I am sending out invitations almost every week or two to different Chinese professors and others. And they just, they, they'll talk to me for coffee. But as soon as I say, well, would you like to come and, you know, come on the show? Like, no, 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 can't do that. Sorry. Even journalists and things and, and younger people, they're just, there's just not in the culture to do that. And especially in this day and age that we're in today. And I'm wondering, and again, I think you had a similar challenge with your book. Um, was that some, am I correct in that? Or do you feel that you captured the Chinese voice in this engagement as, as effectively as you did the Ethiopian international, the Americans, the Europeans, and the other stakeholders? I definitely see what you mean. Um, I think the challenge that we face, um, and I think that, um, you know, because you guys, you know, the type of um, content that you produce, um, you know, you have to have a guest there to to speak into the microphone and be on the record. Whereas I, you know, I have the the luxury of taking a few ideas and building on them, um, even though the person does not want to be on the record. So I think that um, the challenges that we face are uh, the challenges are a little bit different. But the, on the Chinese side, I think that the there is the the reluctance to speak publicly about an issue might might come from a place of a um, you know even culturally the idea that you have enough authority to to speak about a certain issue um, and. Y- you know, you give your individual perspective on the record might be a risky endeavor. Not because, not only because you might say the wrong thing, but also because um, there's like this level of humility. I think um, that that might hold people back. Um, the second thing is, I I personally, um, you know, when I when, like you said, you know, you have coffee with a researcher or you know just someone. You know, I, I made a, a few friends, for example, in Ethiopia who are Chinese and who were very open to discuss what they what they thought, you know, they, to discuss exactly how they feel. Um, but as as a as someone who tries to back up your your statements with actual citations, it's hard to to take their claims and and say this is factual because the it's hard to access a lot of the data that's happening between China and Africa and all and you don't know who's keeping track and those who are keeping track, which is probably on the Chinese side, are not readily sharing them. So it's hard to to gather like a bunch of anecdotal evidence. So that is how I see it. So, you know, in, in your in, in looking at a wide range of topics from year to year, um, what are some of the, the kind of big meta trends that you that you drawing from from these last few years that you will draw into the future of China Africa relations? I know that's always a difficult question <laughs> to answer and a lot of researchers don't like to be to be speculative. But you know, kind of what what of, of the ones that you that you were looking at, which would you bet on on you know really shaping the relationship in the few years to come? I actually, you know, one of the things I say is that I do not want to predict anything that's going to happen in this space because things are so versatile. Um, but there's one thing that I am 
very curious about, and I say this all the time, and it's the students, the students who are studying here in China. And, you know, um, if someone has heard me speak before and they're listening to your podcast and I'm repeating this uh, same concept again, I apologize. But I th- I really truly believe in, in this, which is the students here, the African students here that are learning uh, in not only the content of, you know, the, their PhD or whatever, but also how this Chinese society is getting organized around new things like technology and social interactions and like entrepreneurship. These are such eye-opening times and being thrust into that um, as, you know, an average uh, citizen of an African nation is incredibly important. And once they, the students, they graduate from their programs you know, I'm really curious to see what the trend would be. Where are they going to go and how are they going to, are they going to work for their governments? Are they going to negotiate on, on behalf of their country? Um, are they going to, you know, are they going to foster better relations? And the, what I'm seeing is that because we have an entire um, population of um, educated Africans who are incredibly China savvy and they're going to enter a lot of different sectors, it might be, they might, elevate the the idea of the African agency and that's what I think is going to influence the coming the coming years and if they don't if they end up being quiet and if they end up um, not being as influential as we expect them that's also telling in in and of itself why 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 wouldn't what why wouldn't they get there so that is what i'm ant- anticipating and hoping for and you know all of the other trends um i think the the the, the biggest things you know the biggest trend uh, or i call them mega themes the bigger the biggest mega themes that I cover include you know the the US um China competition for influence and the trend you know we in the China Africa space you guys talk about this uh, quite frequently as well it's it's basically it feels like China has a more long term understanding of what it wants from these relationships and uh, what it can offer and whereas the US is has gotten worse and worse over time in terms of defining a strategy and this is nothing new that i'm saying it's it's all over you know um, all over the news all over the internet so those things are like going to the future the students and then the the a thread that i followed over the last four years that that has become unexpected you know unexpectedly um, w- worse and worse is just the role of the U.S. vis-a-vis China and Africa. So, you know, that's my view. The book is The Complete Beginner's Guide to China-Africa Relations, mega themes from five crucial years going back from 2014 all the way till 2018 by Lena Gedecho Ayeno. Uh, it is really an indispensable book for, you know, and I'll even say you said it's for the beginners, um, I would say it's such a, a broad breadth of all the key topics that it's even useful for the experts just to keep refreshing of what was happening in 2016, what was happening back in 2015. And in some ways, it's almost like a reference book. And that's the reason why I love it. It's it's really, I can't say enough good things about it. It's published by Dalu Media, uh, and you can find it on Amazon. Now, Lena, Amazon is not really that big here in China. So if people are in Ethiopia or in Kenya or in South Africa or here in China and they want to buy your book, how do they do it? So uh, right now it's available on Amazon.com, um, as you, you've said. Um, in China, it only has a few editions, I mean, a few copies um, at the Bookworm in Beijing. Um, you know, honestly speaking, I did not think the book was going to need that, you know, big of a distribution, you know, muscle because I did not know that the reception of the book was going to be quite um, 
you know, enthusiastic. So I'm going to try and um, get it to be more widely available, at least in, you know, in universities across um, parts of Africa. So that is the plan. And, you know, I'd like to take this opportunity for people to contact me if, if they would like to incorporate it as part of their institutions or their libraries. Excellent. And if people want to stay in touch with you after, you know, you're on social media, what's the best way for them to follow what you're reading and writing and to connect with you and to learn more about what your next projects are going to be? How can they get in touch? So they can go to um, www.linaayeno.com and leave me a message. And that's where I usually, um, you know, I have a bank of my professional life and the work that I do. I just collect everything on there. Um, It's new, but I am going to be um, writing more on it. And on social media, I am on LinkedIn. Um, In fact, I have been shying away from social media for the majority of my life. I just started becoming more and more active on LinkedIn, so they can find me there as well. Lina Gerecho Ayeno is a Beijing-based author, a new author, and congratulations on that, by the way, and social entrepreneur (laughs) from Ethiopia, and really one of what I think and what we both think are a rising voice in the China-Africa space, and one we're so proud to have you on the program to kind of to acknowledge your your first book, really a great, uh, great accomplishment. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So, Kobus, at the top of the show, we talked about the five must-read books for China Africa. I'm definitely going to put this one on the list. Um, It has its shortcomings. As I said, there's not, a, to me, in my opinion, not a strong enough Chinese voice. I don't think that's Lena's fault. It is very, very difficult to get that China voice in the discussion. You and I are struggling with it, so it's no surprise that other people are as well. But I think her book is important for a couple of different reasons. One, because, again, it is for the non-expert. We've seen the growth of the China Africa Project go from zero to a million followers now. The vast majority of our followers are also non-professional, non-experts who are interested in this subject, who are interested in China. They're interested in global affairs, interested in politics, but maybe not that interested that they want to wade through uh, an academic book or a deep journalist book. And so I think in this way, she does fill a void. And it's very interesting how she kind of organized it by year. So you do see that optimism from 2014 all the way to the more skeptical, more complex, more critical relationship that exists now between China and Africa in 2018. Yes, I, I think that's a really big strength of the book um, because it, it really shows you how dynamic the relationship is and how, how quickly it evolves. You know, so things that are now that we now think of as, as the kind of the major issues of China-Africa relations, things like debt, for example, they, re, they only became controversial relatively recently. You know, like as, as early as 2017, people were still completely fine with, with Chinese lending, not criticizing it basically at all. Um, now it's one of the most criticized aspects of the relationship. And I think she really shows the evolution of those issues. Um, and I think it, she, she really builds a fantastic base for people who want to immerse themselves in it and to then take it forward and see how these issues are going to evolve into the future. And if you want to buy the book one more time, uh, again, if you don't live in an area where you can buy the hard copy book, it is available on Amazon. We've been very enthusiastic about it. We have no financial relationship in this. We don't get any There's no money. There's no nothing. We're just excited when there's new books like this that are expanding the discussion of the China-Africa relationship, again, in ways that do not conform to the stereotypes. It's not about neocolonialism and taking over. It is about the complexity. And there's so much little nuance and detail that she has in this rather thick book because it's covering a lot of ground uh, that we think it's definitely a, a, a great, great read for 2019. So that'll do it. Uh, Very quickly before we go, I want to give a nice little shout out to Alex Wong of China Impact Ventures, who's a new listener to the podcast and reached out. And then Cooper Jewell, who is a junior at the University of Portland in Oregon, also another listener to the show. And uh, they came to Shanghai and uh, also had a chance to meet with them. And I want to thank them for taking the time. Uh, I love hearing from you. Kobus loves hearing from you. Eric at ChinaAfricaProject.com or Kobus at ChinaAfricaProject.com. We are on track and getting back to every single email that comes our way. So 
Don't be shy. Reach out to us. Say hello. We always love to hear from you. Uh, it's a community that we're building, and we want to make sure that we are accessible to you. So if you have questions, if you're a journalist, if you're doing a paper for school, uh, let us know, and uh, we'll bounce around some ideas with you, and we always just want to say hi. So we appreciate that. So that'll do it. Until next week, we'll be back again with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. For Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China in Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.